previously on Classroom Hacks. Be mindful about confidence and being cocky, but also be mindful about humility and passivity. And so this is where it came into play. The person who interviewed first, when she went through her interview, she went through the entire thing, and one of the things he said stuck out to him the most was that she consistently reiterated the point, I'm just so happy for this opportunity, thank you for having me, anything that you need from me, I will do. And he said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being humble, but the problem with that was that she didn't necessarily incorporate her value to the particular place she was interviewing. And the fact that she was just happy for the opportunity didn't necessarily separate her from the rest of the pack, people who were hungry, people who knew exactly what they could bring to the table, and people who knew how they fit into the program. When you're just happy for the opportunity, a lot of times the department might just look at you and say, okay, this is someone who doesn't really have direction and is waiting for direction. The thing he told me that stuck out the most was he said, you either live by your sword or you die by your sword but you have to have a sword because otherwise you're just like everybody else good morning everybody sorry for the brief hiatus but every now and then people just need to take a break and re-energize but we are back it is monday july 30th and we have a brand new episode of classroom hacks for you episode 13 what makes teaching worth it and we all know teaching isn't an easy job hell there are times when it's just enjoyably painful Teachers are not always thanked or appreciated, and students, parents, and people outside of education don't always see the extra hours before and after class that educators put in. However, despite the harder days, there are definitely elements of teaching that make it more satisfying than almost any other profession in the world. And on today's episode, we look at some of those experiences educators have that have made this job worth it, and we hope that our stories work and are a reminder of why you continue to teach and why you got into education in the first place and before transitioning into that as a reminder because i know we were off for a week but we are live from the pantheon of pedagogy the mecca of methodology your vacation from vacation with your pedagogical parakeets where you can learn to seriously take teaching not so seriously this is and we are classroom hacks i'm eric jason jacob tan so that is your legal full name I'm, I'm not going to give all my names i'll just say sure sure i mean because you know, i'm peter Kinetis. right because all the the greek names in there is going to be like super extensive yeah stephanopoulos and papadopoulos and socrates plato aristotle so pedro today's episode like i said we we go through our ups and downs a few episodes ago we talked about failure and today we're not looking at the failures but the things in education that keep bringing us back that remind us why we do this job what makes teaching worth it for us and before we we dive into the the value and the things we appreciate about teaching when considering some of your previous jobs what elements of those jobs were different from teaching and what is it about teaching that you find more enjoyable than some of those other jobs We'll start with, we'll, we'll, I'll chop this in half. Okay. When considering some of your previous jobs, what elements of those jobs were different from teaching? Yeah, that's a great question. I've, like many people, have uh, had different jobs, careers, you can call them even, but nothing fit exactly. Nothing was, made me feel like a fish in water, if I can put it that way, as much as when I started teaching. You know, like in the movies, you see when it could be, whether it's um, a government official or an, a, 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 like an FBI person or even a bad guy and they're trying to crack a safe or they're trying to find a combination of something to, to, to break in a code or to go into a computer program and they find one digit at a time and like the numbers are going really fast until the right com- – and then finally the right combination of numbers come and it stops. Mm-hmm. That's how it felt with me in teaching. I felt for many years I was trying to find – Uh, I mean, look, we all have our skills, our talents, our gifts, and it's a matter of finding at times where, with my gifts and talents and skills, what is the best fit. 
And it just felt that way with teaching. And, and looking back, it makes sense because, and I've said this before in previous podcasts, some of the people who've had the biggest influence on me have been other teachers. And not just because of the subject matter, but because of other things about life that they taught us in the classroom. And so I, when I began teaching, I, I thought to myself that the way I've been helped by other teachers, I want to help other students in, in the same way. Yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely say that I noticed... Uh, many different things about when I was growing up in terms of what teaching sort of brought to the table. And every time I went to class, I felt like, you know, we might have been covering something similar, but there was were different elements to what was going on, especially as you went through the different levels of school. And with some of the other jobs I had, whether it was in fast food or in sales or in the medical areas, you kind of like, you learn everything you can at that particular level and then it sort of just plateaus for you because I mean like when I was when I worked in sales I worked at four different levels at Bloomingdale's whether it was shipping and receiving whether it was in merchandising whether it was in the cafe and then to high-end sales and then for each of those particular areas you sort of learn everything that you can about those areas and you kind of hit a wall because there's only so many different things that you can do uh, within those particular parameters, especially in a sort of non-sales area. With sales, you can be somewhat more creative because you're dealing with different customers and you have to know their different stories. But definitely in the more pragmatic, straightforward, logistical areas, it's just you, you, come, you come in, you know exactly what needs to be done. You become more robotic or like... <laughs> Uh, an automaton and then you just do what you have to do and then it's done and of course those things have their their benefits and their vices but it doesn't give you the flexibility to be as creative or as flexible as you might want to be especially if you're the type of person who likes to engage and likes to interact and do all those different things now to now that we've we spliced this question in half let's let's look at the other end of it is what is it about teaching that you find more enjoyable than some of the other jobs that you've had? And we know that in the past you have talked about acting and how your your acting career has sort of tr- helped you transition and become a better teacher. But what is it about teaching that you find more enjoyable than some of the other ventures that you've sort of been on? Well, the part where it overlaps is, of course, with acting, one of the reasons why people become performers of any type is to connect with the audience to connect with, whether it's uh, audience on a written page, maybe you're a writer or you're a dancer or actor, singer, painter, etc. You're trying to connect to the audience, trying to reach them somehow, trying to either send a message try, or trying to make them feel something, to make them think, etc., etc., and to connect with them. And so with teaching, it's the same, same thing in terms of we're trying to create meaningful experiences, uh, things that will be relevant for them in their lives in, in some way, shape, or form. And the beautiful thing about teaching is any subject matter, that, that can be done. Uh, whether I teach philosophy or English or science or history or math, etc., we can find ways to connect what we're doing in the classroom uh, to their lives, even if they're not going to be math majors or English majors or whatever <clears throat> subject matter we specialize in. We can still connect it to their lives and make it meaningful for them and uh, show them how it does make a difference in life. And that's part of the challenge of teaching, right, is showing how is this relevant uh, in your life. Yes, you need these classes to pass, to graduate, to get to the next level, to get the degree, to get the job. But there's also a payoff in other ways that will make a difference in your life. I would agree with that uh, assessment 100%. I would also say that, at least I know for me, one of the things that has been Uh, extremely satisfying about this job is that every year it seems like there's a there's a new challenge that awaits us and not just in the new coming students but the culture changes and especially when you're in the liberal arts department like myself and Pedro are that you you have to also kind of adjust with the cultural norms you have to adjust with the conversations you have to adjust with the incoming perceptions that many of these students have because you know even though say you maybe have only been teaching three four five years it's a it's a it's crazy how much a society and culture can change within that short amount of time when your students come in who are, are having different perspectives or they're the next generation of actual students, their mindset on many different topics is going to be brand new. It's going to be 
completely different than how you might have seen things. And they're going to bring a perspective that challenges you as much as you want to challenge them. And I mean, if you think about it now, especially if you're a college teacher like we are, that the incoming freshmen will most likely have been born in the year 2000. That's and that's that's mind blowing oh to goodness. me. That's, that's that mind boggling. So and so that's that's some of the the things that uh, you know stick out to me, especially when it comes to this sort of occupation. And we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, we're gonna talk about some of the experiences that we've had, where maybe we've directly impacted certain students' lives, and they've kind of came back and had a sort of positive thing to say about their experience in our class, the student evaluations we received and how those things help rejuvenate our desire to teach. And so we'll talk about that right after this commercial break. Hello, everyone. Can I let you in on a little secret? Well, to be honest, it's kind of a big deal. Fall semester is right around the corner, and the College of DuPage will hold its annual Writing on the Edge conference on Saturday, October 20th. Now, remember that secret I just mentioned? Well, here it is. This year's conference is titled Composing Beyond Boundaries, and it's WOTE's biggest conference to date. Here, learn, and examine the most modern discussions about methodology, classroom innovation, and faculty life in and outside of the world of academia. WOTE is always working to link disciplines, colleagues, students, and communities, and would like to invite all of its instructors who use writing and multimodal practices in their courses. Find out more about WOTE from their website at writingontheedge.org. Classroom Hacks will be in attendance and we'll be headlining one of the sessions, so don't miss out. We hope to see you guys in October. Do you ever say this? And we are back. So, as I said before the break, this part of the episode, we're gonna kind of talk about moments when we've been given sort of positive praise or have been given feedback by students, administrators, colleagues about what we're doing and sort of reinvigorating us, reinvigorating us to remind us why we do what we do. And, you know, I know one of the tenets and the pillars of this podcast is that educators like to teach and they also like to complain. And it's true about both of those things. <laughs> but the complaint is always the second part. At the, at the core of it, we all love to teach. And here are a few reminders of why we love what we do, why we love teaching, going in every day, despite not always getting recognized for it. So Pedro, any any stories you have about things that have happened or students or individuals that have sort of reignited and reminded you of why you do what you do? Yeah, what's the famous Mark Twain quote? I can live for two months on a good compliment. Because we know Eric, we know no matter what we do for a living, just even in just in life overall, um, there's always going to be people who uh, enjoy or appreciate what you do. You know, there's 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 compliments and there's insults. I mean, I, I, I had a good friend years ago, and she's a, a very good actress, and uh, she even teaches acting. She thought Meryl Streep was not very good. Really? And and you think what Meryl? Sh-? It just goes to show you that even you can look at someone like Meryl Streep, and then there'll be people out there who are still, you know, doubters or doomsayers. And I've learned also, and this is a quote. Before I say anything else, I want to share this quote from the movie *The Greatest Showman*. Mm-hmm. Came out this last year. Hugh Jackman plays P.T. Barnum. His wife, Charity Barnum, played by Michelle, the lovely and talented Michelle Williams. But I, I guess I could say, you know, Hugh Jackman is lovely and talented as well. It was a talented cast. Sure, very much so. Okay, so with that established, she says to him at one point, "You don't need everyone to love you; just a few good people." It's a good quote. Because uh, no matter how good of, uh, of uh, teachers we are or are not, because we can always get better, obviously, we should always be students of our craft, not everyone is going to like us as a teacher or as a person. That's just the way life is. We know this. And so, you know, I'll give one specific one that, because okay. that, it is so specific and it's so odd, but in a good way, that it's, it's a short one, so don't worry. So in, in uh, philosophy, when we do, um, there's a, a branch of philosophy known as epistemology, which is discussing theories of knowledge and, and truth and so forth. And I had a student come, come up to me at the end of the semester, and she said to me that learning that knowledge is basically 
justify true belief and it's not a perfect definition uh, get your problems notwithstanding she said that uh, learning about what knowledge is or just having a better idea of what is helped her get over a breakup and I was like wait what I've never been told this before she said because she had all these thoughts and beliefs about her boyfriend and about their relationship that when she examined them and took the time to contemplate them she realized that a lot of her beliefs about him or about the relationship were not justified in other words that she began to realize wait we weren't a good fit for each other the breakup isn't a bad thing and she was saying that it wasn't this nasty breakup it wasn't a breakup where they were cussing and screaming at each other it was but she was just very very understandably so upset like we oftentimes are during a breakup and so she was just saying that it has helped her to be a little more to use her reason and it wasn't a magic wand that solved everything and that she was all her emotions went away and she was just happy and skipping zippity doo dah but it helped her to see that in the long run this is a good thing for her and so I, I said to her I said this I've never been told this before thank you for telling me this because this is such a what a um, interesting and I would say inspiring bit of feedback because mm. I'm thinking wow philosophy it gets the knock of it's not very applicable to life it's so abstract but here she applied it to her life in a very real and profound way well the reason why I like that story is because you're gonna always get a handful of students at the end of the semester who will say oh this is a great class I really enjoyed it but it's when you can get that student who like you said was able to take what you had in class and actually apply it to her life and not just kind of regurgitate the things we talk about in class, but find the meaning behind a lot of that in association to what she was actually dealing with in real life. And I know for me, the the first couple semesters when I first started teaching, I was very, very by the book. I kind of did things that because I wanted to fly under the radar. I didn't want to, you know, stir the pot too much or do anything crazy. So I kind of was very by the book and I, I did all my lesson plans through there and I lived vicariously through the textbook. Yeah. And it wasn't until my second year where I started when I was given both a introductory class and then a research class where I, I kind of said, you know what, I'm going to branch out a little bit. I'm going to try different things and experiment a little bit more. And I, I started to finally come out of my shell a bit and become more of the teacher that I always wanted or aspired to be and not just sort of this book-based instructor. And it was at the end of that year, that first semester of that year, I had a student come to me and she told me that I was transferring. I had planned to transfer out of this school because it was just it, these last year and a half, this last year and a half has been just awful. I have not liked my classes. I have not liked my time experience here. And she said it was your class that I came to that actually brightened my day because we got to talk about things that I haven't had the opportunity to talk about. I got to express myself in ways I didn't get to. I've gotten to write and do different sort of responses and assignments and activities that. I have not had the option to do in the past and she thanked me for it and it was one of those things that like I was saying with the previous story you get these sort of just generalized compliments about how students may enjoy your classes or the type of work you're doing is beneficial or is positive but when you reach the student that tells you that they were headed in one direction and then all of a sudden your class gave them a sort of perspective that shifted them in another for me, that is extremely meaningful and significant. And I know Pedro and I are not unfamiliar with different sorts of positive feedback. I'm not going to toot my own horn or I'm not going to toot Pedro's own horn over there, but we usually do receive positive feedback for our classes. And it's not because we're Hall of Fame level instructors. There are many other teachers out there who I think are very, very well crafted at their job, at the at the gifts that they have when they bring to the classroom. But I do know that when we do go into our classrooms, we give it everything we have. And we do like to put our students at the, at the head of that because we like to have students engage. We like to have students talk and get them out of their shells a lot of times because we try to create an atmosphere that is more welcoming and more inclusive than exclusive with a lot of these things. And I think students can appreciate things like that. Yeah, that's a, a very good point in terms of, of, I like what you said about, well, especially that we're not uh, Hall, of Fame, Hall of Fame teachers. I mean, look. Yet, it, yet. Yet. I mean, that's the goal for all of us, right? You know, it's funny because I've had 
evaluations, you know, at the end of the year or the end of the semester, student evaluations were in the same class of students who say, oh, best class, favorite teacher, and other students saying, worst class, I hate this teacher. And what I try to do is, the, what I appreciate about, the, or what I try to do for both of those, the positive and the negative, is I try to look for the specifics, going back to that, about what was it about the class or about me that they didn't like. If there's, if it, some things are beyond our control, I mean, just let's face it, sometimes someone starts to speak, and for, say we're somewhere where there's a, a public speaker or something, we just... Maybe the sound of their voice, or maybe they remind us of an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend or an ex someone who irritates us, and therefore I don't like this person. It may not be the content, it may not be their message. It's just them. And that, that let's face it, that just happens. That's beyond our control. But then the, the things that are in our control, I look for those within the comments to see if they're just emoting or. I'm like, wow, they they didn't have a good experience of the class or of me, and, and they have a legitimate reason why. I need to work on that. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we look for patterns, right? Now, it's not the outliers all the time that, that make the difference, but the patterns. But at the same time, not to, I guess, just to contradict myself here, the outliers need to pay attention to as well. But, again, I've learned that it's never going to be a case where everyone has the same experience in the class. We want to try and reach as many students as possible, provide meaningful experiences for as many students as possible. But at the same time, we realize that uh, like any human being, we're, we're not perfect, but we're going to consistently and constantly work to become better at our crafts. Definitely. And I think that's a great note to end on. For our next episode, we will be talking about criticism. I know it's something that is inescapable throughout your careers or in any walk of life that you go through you were going to get feedback you're going to I get did jump ahead. reviews Sorry. and criticism but it was a good segue pete pete always has the great segues it's a combination episode where we're talking about the criticism we've received and how we've dealt with it and then also implementing our own criticism and feedback in our classes so until then thank you for joining us as always we appreciate it remember you can find classroom hacks on all your favorite social media networks facebook instagram twitter and of course SoundCloud where you can find this podcast so we do appreciate you listening in and stopping by our social media sites on a regular please help us continue to grow this little project that we've been working on so Pedro anything else to say before we vamanos I think that's it for now I uh, of course have much to say about negative feedback as well (laughs) and we will hear about that next time so until then adios goodbye arrivederci Why do you teach and what are some of the things that make teaching worth it for you? Because obviously there are good days and bad days and there have been days where I've, I've ripped my hair out and say, why the hell do I do this thing when I don't, we don't get compensated enough. We put in more hours than people realize. Our kids hate us. We, we don't know if they're learning what we want them to learn. And then you you feel like you went through the ringer but then at the same time at the end of the semester there's always something that kind of brings you back and reminds you again why you kind of got into this profession so why do you teach and what are some of the things that make it worth it for you so like you were saying there are some days where the kids just i've just had like my patients have worn thin for the day like i have my patience is pretty good but sometimes like the events of the day like what happens or what the conversations we've had or the conversations we didn't have uh, my patience is thin but at the end of the year last year what brought it all back for me was like some of this like, it felt like i got to some of the students like the last day of school like some of the kids i had first semester they came back and say hey miss win wanted to let you know i had a great time in your classroom thanks for everything they you know they came and like gave me like a you know a handshake kind of thing and that was like all right well this i haven't seen this kid for like a few months and he came back in my classroom hey miss win i had a good time thanks thanks for everything mm-hmm. you know i'm gonna graduate well you're gonna be at graduation yeah i'll be there okay well i'll see you at graduation so that was i felt like oh that's nice like and i, I had more than one student do that to me also for like senior war night is also when i when i felt like it was like, this is why I do this. Like I have, I had a lot of students on that stage and they had a lot of students get a lot of scholarship awards. And the one thing that hit me is like, I had a student who was writing a scholarship essay in my classroom and it was totally off topic and it wasn't, he wasn't supposed to be, but he was doing it anyway. I'm like, okay, well, he's like, can you help me with this essay? Sure. So I helped him and he was like trying to reword some stuff or like, how do I organize my thoughts a little bit better to get this point across? I'm like, oh, well maybe you should write it like this. So at the, at senior night, at senior award night, the presenter was presenting the scholarship and she said like, I'm going to read something to you guys from this essay. And he, and she read what, 
what the section that we were working on. I'm like, holy crap, this is this kid was working on this. They're reading this. I know who's going to get this award. Like, this is my student. So mm-hmm. that was like, man, I felt like I helped this kid like get money to go to school and further his education by by doing that. So I, I, it felt good to me. And there was a lot of students afterwards that I met afterwards, and like they were, their parents were there, and they were like, oh, you're a Miss Wynn. We heard a lot about you. I'm like, really? You t- you guys talk about me after school? Like, you guys really listen to what I'm saying in school? And like I've heard that from a lot of parents. Like, oh, we learned a lot about apes, actually, from, from like AP Environmental Science. We actually learned a lot about apes. Like, oh, really? You These kids talk to you about what they learn in, in my classroom? Like, that's really awesome. So I felt like so happy when I hear these things. And it, it brings me back, I'm like, okay, I am making a difference. That's mm-hmm. why I wanted teaching in the first place, not saying no to ideas, expanding their knowledge. If they want to investigate on something, I'm gonna let them go investigate it. I'm not gonna hold them back from, from learning. If they want to learn, I'm gonna let them learn or allow, allow them to learn. So that's, that's what brings it back for me. Yeah, if you if you go back into our archives and listen to Carrie's episode on It's My First Day, one of the things she does talk about is why she transitioned from her previous uh, place of employment into the the world of academia and education. One of the, the reasons is because you create a connection with your students. And when you see the sort of people they become, the ideas that they produce, the ways that you've changed their life that they that they reflect on, that they voice to you. There's there's really not too many things that can replace that. It makes me so happy. 